what, is, what will be in this second chapter of these bridge notes that I'm going to post. Um, it's a Fourier Vi relation, essentially. So, of course, we have this description for Gaussian states. Well, in principle, we already have a bridge to the Hilbert space. I, even, I didn't really show it, but in order to get some of these results, like evaluate the covariances, you need to go to the Fock basis, which is already in the Hilbert space. But a most sophisticated, I would say, and, and powerful bridge between Hilbert space and, and, and by the way, you always need to go into the, even though Gaussian dynamics may be trivial, this is sometimes a, a point that is raised against this sort of continuous variable problems, right? Because people in, in, the, in the sort of uh, field theoretical tradition, they call these theories quasi-free. They call them quasi-free because of the normal mode decompositions that I showed, which is you can always diagonalize these Hamiltonians and solve the dynamics. That's true, but that's not the point. I mean, solving a problem in quantum information such as typically is the state entangled or not, it's not equivalent to solving some dynamics. So uh, that objection is uh, it's unfounded, so it's essentially. So these problems are still difficult, as we're going to see. And, uh, and whenever you want to face those problems, you have to go into the Hilbert space. So one way to go into the Hilbert space is the Fox space that we saw. But a very powerful way is the Fourier vial which is essentially the, the characteristic function. And uh, by which I mean, essentially, that displacement operators that we saw already form a basis in, in this, uh, form an orthonormal basis or a complete set with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt product. And the consequence, I'm going to state this only for a single mode, because stating it with many modes will be unwieldy and unnecessary at this stage. So, but what I mean is I can write any row, any state. Let's, let's talk about a state. It, can, it could be any bounded operator, but as an integral of a C2 of uh, D alpha. Let me just be sure I use the, right, the same convention. Well, I'm not. So d minus alpha uh, trace the alpha rho. This pi normalizes this convention. And where d alpha is the displacement operator, but written in terms of, of complex variables with ladder operators as a basis of operators, that would be this. You're familiar with this, I think, because you've seen Gauss, um, coherent states and all in the day before yesterday. And, but that's, this is the same as what we wrote before with X and P and that omega. This product corresponds to coupling X and P's through the omega matrix. Check it out. Like you, upon this identification. Yeah? This is alpha is x plus ip over square root of 2. And then you get the same, and a dagger and a are the ladder operators. OK, I don't, I don't want to go into these details. But essentially, what this, statement say, what this statement is is that you can expand a row in the basis of d alphas. Yeah? I know that mathematically this, this, this statement is slightly questionable, but you know, allow me the freedom to be a bit sloppy. And um, that's what I call Fourier vial. And this, in fact, is, that's the characteristic function. There's a symmetrically ordered characteristic function of, of the state rho. Yeah? So then, if we... Uh, Yeah, if we um, Fourier transform this, we take the complex Fourier transform, you get the Wigner function. And we already talked about that, and I don't want to get into this. But as you know, there's a, a number of these 
quasi-probability function, or these this phase space representations. And another one is the P function. And did you, are you familiar with the B, P function so I get a sense of what the audience know? You don't know about the P function. Okay, cool. So let me, let me get, be a bit, a bit more specific. I'm not going to show this relationship, uh, how to prove it, because that would be a bit lengthy. But I'm going to give you one bit, which is, this is based on a very interesting uh, representation of the projection on the vacuum. This is equivalent to this, to an equation that we're going to need later, and which is proven in the notes. Oh, 1 over pi, 1 over pi, 1 over pi. Why am I, no, no, uh, C2, no, C, not C2, C. Hmm. So minus or plus is the same, yeah. So I just mentioned that, and this is proven in the notes, yeah? So that's how you derive this. And uh, use the fact that essentially the set of coherent states is an overcomplete set. You can resolve the identity through it. Let me, let me just mention another important equality, which is the identity operator in the Hilbert space, at the Hilbert space level is one over pi alpha, alpha, squared alpha, hmm? where alpha is a coherent state, so it's the alpha upon the vacuum. Okay, so, so that's a resume of quantum optics in a sense, and, uh, and this is, the, I think this is the most cultural of all the, it's something that all physicists should know, I think. If I had to pick one bit of quantum optics that everyone should know. It's not the Wigner function and all that, because that's just derivative and it's an elaboration, fine. But this is the most important bit, and it's the one that bridges, really, between Hilbert space and the phase space description through this characteristic function. Right? So you can prove that all the, so if, you, if we put the Gaussian definition that we had before, this is explicitly done in the notes, though it's a bit pedantic, but you get a, you get the following. So the, big, the characteristic function of a, of, a, of a Gaussian state uh, chi alpha, um, this is some, so it's e to the, no, 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 chi, uh, let me go back now to my variables there where I remember formula, hopefully. Uh, should be this. You always come with an omega because of the way these canonic, these commutation relations work. And that's sigma. And then you multiply times i r transposed, omega transposed, I think, well, hopefully. This should be up to a phase that. So that's the first moment of the state, and they act as a phase on the characteristic function, and this is the covariance matrix. So this is a characteristic function of a Gaussian state, and this will relate between our phase space description given by sigma and R and the Hilbert space operator through this, okay? If I plug this one in there, I get the expression of a, another alternative expression of a Gaussian state. So this relates to standard quantum optical descriptions. Um, what is I want? Oh yeah, and, when, and then if you take the Fourier transform of this, you get the sigma will go sigma to the minus one, obviously, like for any Gaussian function, and this phase will become a shift. That's what happens, yeah? And then you get the a Wigner function, which is really, you know, for one mode, is a Gaussian blob centered in R, with some shape that is determined by sigma, yeah? And then it degrades, imagine a Gaussian blob, okay? 
and you have this phase space which is given by x and p or alpha through that equation. Okay, so that's very, very briefly a concise um, summary of all these. And, but I want to then go to the peer representation a little bit slightly more specifically. So you can define other characteristic functions. And in particular, you can define chi minus 1 alpha as uh, so same thing, the trace of the alpha rho times um, this. Okay? So, as you notice, we're making things slightly more difficult for ourselves here because this will be. So, when you Fourier transform this, because we're making it narrower, we're taking a risk. Okay? This will be worse behaved than the Vigna. So, when, once we Fourier transform this, then it, it, might, be, it might behave uh, worse than the Vigna function, which is the Fourier transform of that, okay? Because we make it uh, tighter as a distribution. I'll come back to this point because it has a relevance for that entanglement even for, of these systems. It's, a kind of, it's kind of an interesting uh, side remark, but it was very instrumental to um, And then the P representation is the Fourier transform of that. So uh, I think, what, how do I usually, yeah, I think I, I normally, this is normalized that way without a square root, but with a pi there. And then uh, uh, this squared beta, it's e to the alpha beta star minus alpha star beta of chi minus 1 beta, okay? And the peer representation has a very interesting um, property. And this was, well, this line was almost worth, uh, not, not, not alone, but it, it was instrumental to getting a Nobel Prize for Glaube, eh? so. This is the renowned Glauber Sudarshan representation. Which is that rho equals simply this. That's just some, some really freakish equation that. So they're so over complete. <laughs> Coherent states are so far reaching that you can even express any state as a, a um, mixture, in a sense, of diagonal of projectors on Gaussians, on coherent states. What's the catch? Because so, so, some of you will know what. There's a problem, of course, in what I just said. That P alpha is usually not even a function, right? It's something nasty. Not only negative, but like could be derivative of delta functions, some distribution, but not a function, yeah? So it can still be defined consistently that way. And uh, let me mention how to prove this, because I want to, this is, this is really interesting that, so if you add a d alpha there and there, yeah, we will get uh, a d alpha there and a d minus alpha there. d minus alpha is the same as d alpha dagai. 
their unitarism. And um, so but this equals then projector on alpha. And this will just, this will shift this operator by alpha and minus alpha, so by zero, but will then give a phase. You should be familiar with this. That if I combine two shift operators, I get the operator which is the sum of the shifts times some phase. That phase embodies the canonical commutation relations. Yeah? In this case, that phase sort of reads this way. So, so if I write down what I have on the right hand side there, 2 square alpha 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 uh, p alpha. This is an interesting proof, so I want to show it explicitly. This will be 1 over pi uh, c d squared alpha, and then I do the other integral in, I don't know, say uh, gamma. There's a p alpha, which is this one. But the, the projector on alpha, I want to write it with this integral. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, e to the minus gamma squared. And then I've got the phase, which is alpha gamma star minus alpha star Gamma. The phase is the effect of these two. And this is gamma. Uh, why do I have minus gamma there? Oh. oh, it's the same. I can choose both plus and minus there. Because it's phase invariant, that, that statement. So. And, then, uh, and then I've got... Uh, Ah, yes, this is really nice, in fact. Ah, now, what this, yeah, so, ah, yeah, so this integral will give me the counter, so I have, I, get, I end up with the characteristic function with this, because I'm counter Fourier transforming the P, and then multiplying by that, yeah? Now think about it, this is, because we got P by Fourier transforming that, yeah? So then, that's why this works. So the integral in alpha is uh, eaten up, and I get my chi 1. Why is it chi? Oh, maybe I should have called it minus 1. Ah, I see why I was an idiot. So, yeah, I've been an idiot. That's pretty bad. Okay, so that's why this, because this, I started to question myself because of this minus, and now it, it all works. So, and this, I said something really stupid before, which is, of course I made myself more trouble, I make myself more trouble if I multiply this by something divergent like this exponential. Yeah? Okay? So, sorry about that. <laughs> so that's why this P is less regular. And, uh, Whereas if I put the minus, you get the Q representation, which is more regular. My bad. But fortunately, I went through this, and then I found out about my mistakes. Uh, and um, yeah, just let me just be sure I learned this. Da, da, da. Yes, chi one. Now this is a gamma. And uh, e to the minus squared. Ah. ah, yes. And this is D minus 
which is 1 over pi integral over c of this squared gamma, fantastic, chi 0 gamma, okay, so we counter Fourier transform this and get chi 1 times that, but chi 1 times c to the minus alpha squared is chi 0. Yeah? And chi 0 goes there. Now, what's this? That's the integral of chi 0 times this, the basis. Yes. By using the Fourier Weyl relation, which is the first thing I wrote, this is raw, which is exactly what we were set out, we were set in, we set out to prove. Okay? So this is how you prove this celebrated representation. Why am I making all this fuss about this? Um, the reason is that, yeah, I was hoping this would be a bit more obvious to see, but like, never mind. So, no, actually it is, it is quite clear. Now, in going from alpha to these x functions, you get a factor two because of this square root. Trust me, to try, try it out. And then you see that essentially what this becomes, this factor there, becomes e to the rtr over four, hmm? which is also equal, so this is equal really. I mean, for a single mode, eh? But it doesn't really matter. Omega t, omega one quarter r. Now, so for the p function, for the p function of a Gaussian state, to be well defined, well, to be uh, well behaved. And we'll see what that means. But, and by well behaved, I mean not worse behaved than a delta function. Um, it must be sigma greater or equal than the identity. Why? Because, see, in order to get the, the chi 1, I need to multiply this by one quote this factor. Yeah? So the quadratic part would be essentially, if I want chi 1, I need to simply put sigma minus one identity there as a matrix, yeah? And in order to be able to then transform, Fourier transform this properly, I want all the eigenvalues of this to be uh, pos positive, okay? And if they are zero, you get some delta functions. But if they are worse, then you can't define a proper a function like that. Uh, like, so, so you can define this, but it won't be uh, a function or a delta function. It'll be like some other distribution. Okay? So at this stage, this will not tell you much, but we'll see why this is very important to us. Yeah? That's the, the one result I wanted to go through. And it's also useful. You get some manipulation of these P functions. And it's, after all, uh, a college on quantum optics. So. Right. Um, so now we can go on to discuss the entanglement. of Gaussian states. 
And uh, so first off, what is an entangled state? You probably know it, but you know, be self-contained. Let me repeat it. So, so rho is separable. if and only if. So a state of a, a composite system with Hilbert space A and Hilbert space B is separable if and only if you can write it down as a convex combination, probabilistic mixture of product states. These are all the states that can be, uh, sorry, AJ. These are the states that can be formed from uncorrelated states through local operation and classical communication, yeah? Because the hypothetical Alice will uh, sample this distribution and then when, they, when, she, when she gets a J, calls up Bob and instructs him to create the state rho BJ whilst she creates the state uh, rho AJ entirely locally, right? So that, that's how you do it. And that's how you correlate two coins through this ignorance, okay? And rho is entangled, so you probably all know this, but if and only if uh, uh, is not, rho is not separable. Right, so then, uh, um, okay, there are many tests to check entanglement. This, 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 they, they, the whole extent of the, their study would be beyond the scope of this lecture, but I want just to mention one test, which is PPT, positivity of the partial transposition, yeah? Uh, which is that if rho is separable and can therefore be written that way, then uh, rho tilde, tilde will stand for partial transposition, which means we transpose only in one of the two Hilbert spaces. Which one is irrelevant? Why is it, why is it that each one is, which one is it? Well, I'll come to that later. Uh, but that will be transposed in this. And of course, if you transpose the whole state, it's still a state, right? It's still positive specifically. And so therefore, it'd be true that this is greater or equal than zero. So, so it's a positive semi-definite operator. So this is a, a, necessary, a necessary condition for separability. And it turns out to be, therefore, because of the mutually exclusive definition of the two notions, nature of the notion, it's also sufficient for, its violation is sufficient for entanglement. So therefore, if rho tilde is not positive semi-definite, it has one negative eigenvalue, then rho is entangled. Okay? Yeah? Cool. So then, and this criterion is only sufficient in general, it's only necessary for uh, separability that is sufficient in general for entanglement, it's not necessary and sufficient. There are PPT entangled states which are called bound entangled because they cannot be distilled, but that's more like quantum information theory really. So here to this extent, let me just say, this is a test to check that whether this is entangled or not, and it turns out that for the most iconic type of continuous variable entanglement, which is a two-mode Gaussian state. That's what you have in the lab, more often than not. Although now with optical comms, they've got these like billions of um, entangled modes, and so the, which would escape this criterion. But basically in all the early days and most of the situation that we're still interested in now, for instance, if you want to check whether um, the light mode of an optomechanical cavity is entangled with a single um, mechanical mode, that's still a, that's still a two-mode Gaussian state, perhaps, and you can still check its 
it's, uh, it's entanglement through the covariance matrix, and it turns out that this condition, which is what we're going to see now, is, is, is not only necessary, but also, it's not only sufficient, but also necessary for Gaussian entanglement of two modes. That's no longer true for, it's still true for one versus any number of modes. It's still true if you have modes which are bisymmetric, which means that they are symmetric if you exchange modes within the same um, uh, partitions. But it's no longer true in general for, for any generic Gaussian states. So of, of many modes, yeah? n plus n modes. But for two modes, this, is, this turned out to be necessary and sufficient, like for two qubits or for a qubit times a, uh, times a q trip in finite dimensions. So, and that's what we, we set out to prove. And um, OK, so the first thing I want to prove is ha, that it's first a sufficient condition for separability. And it's very general. Uh, which is Is it true only for Gaussians, this one? Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure. That's it. An M-mode Gaussian state with a, met with, a, with a covariance matrix which is greater than the identity is always separable. And why? Because we have it already on the whiteboard, on the blackboard. Yeah? Because of this reason. Because then P look at what, what would happen. So this will be the characteristic function, and it will be a well-defined Gaussian, because we just need to, to sorry, it's, it's Fourier transform that goes there. Sorry about the sort of mix-up in notation here. This is complex notation. These are just real, but it's just so that I don't write wrong formula. But because if sigma minus 1 is is that way, and most you can get a delta function, which, which is obviously the p function of a coherent state. Yeah? But um, a projector on a coherent state, see? But uh, this will be well, be well behaved. And this means that in the multimode case, you get a mixture of product states, a well defined positive Gaussian mixture of. Of, uh, of tensor products of coherent states. Yeah? I didn't write the multimode case explicitly, but you can see that this all carries on over. And the reason why everything carries over very simply from the single mode case is that all these vial operators are tensor products over different spaces. They don't let modes talk to each other. Okay, so it's all a direct sum. So the P representation gives immediately this decomposition. So the state must be uh, positive, uh, must be separable, right? So that's the first state. And besides being instrumental to what follows, this, this statement, yes? Are you saying it's separable? Between any mode. Any mode. Any mode within this partition. You split this between any partition of modes, you always end up which brings me to the underlying truth, which, which runs quite deep, is that you always need squeezing to have continuous variable entanglement. By squeezing, I mean 
an eigenvalue of this is smaller than, the, than one. Uh, that, that's a very nice and powerful statement, though it's very simple. Eh? I mean, it's got like far-reaching implications. No squeezing, no entanglement ever in continuous variables for Gaussians because um, if you truncate the Hilbert space and, see, and do things like in finite dimensions, you can get different effects that would not abide by this. But okay, so cool. So this is the the, the first um, thing. Let me let me do everything quite in detail now because. Uh, the second part is that let's now, sp let's, this is for any, for any number of modes, let's focus, let's now uh, consider two mode states. As we saw in the previous lectures, we can disregard the first moments as far as entanglement is concerned quite safely because they can be adjusted by LOCC as we like. So. Uh, let's just consider two mode states and then we call sigma, which is where we encode all the information about the state as sigma A, sigma B, and sigma AB. So we, um, sigma A is um, the two times two covariance matrix of mode A and this is the two times two covariance matrix of mode B, and, and, and this is where the correlations are, yeah? And uh, the first remark is that you can always reduce it. There is always a set of local operations that leads this to the standard form through symplectic uh, LOCC, let's call them. Uh, I mean, there's no classical communication needed. It's just LO, but LO. Which they're going to... And the standard form is also called um, Simon normal standard form. And this, this expression here, C plus, C minus. So why, how do we do this? Well... So, first off, you have local operation. Based on, this, on the normal mode decomposition for a single mode state, you can always reduce this to Williamson. Ah, that's also the normal mode form is also called, called Williamson form. Because this was, because, <laughs> that's because in the 30s, these things were still being studied to some extent in the third, quite late, considering, you know, how, fundamental this stuff is just quadratic Hamiltonians that would appear in classical mechanics. But the trick was that it's quite difficult to classify everything you can do through symplectic operations on any matrix that is not strictly positive. The strictly positive case that I discussed is a simple one. There's a very well known and notorious uh, appendix to Arnold classical mechanics books where all, book, where all these um, there's also a mistake in the appendix, but all these uh, normal forms are, descri are described, and that was Williamson theory. Williamson were, was interested in all the pathological cases that we don't care about at this stage. So that's called Williamson theorem in the literature often. Although Williamson theorem is about the difficult cases that <laughs> are not just this. But anyway, through by virtue of Williamson theorem, this sigma A and sigma B can be reduced to normal form through local symplectic. And now see, these local, these normal forms are invariant under rotations, under local rotations, which are also symplectic. They are the phase plates that we saw before. And uh, then through those, you can apply one on the left and the different one on the right of the off-diagonal block and uh, do its singular value decomposition that leads it to to diagonal form, regardless of what this is. And you can even, you have enough freedom in these orthogonals that you can choose C, C plus to be greater or equal than C minus. Yeah? Okay, so this is, it's always true that you can apply local operation and classical communications to, uh, to um, achieve this normal form. 
with all these zeros and four parameters which are relevant. And those are the four parameters that are invariant under global and local symplectics. Okay? So then, uh, another lemma it's um, uh, state with determinant of sigma AB greater or equal than zero, then rho is separable. And this is a bit technical and I don't want to get into that because what you do is you show that if the determinant of sigma b is greater than zero, that is, if c plus and c minus have the same sign, you can always define a set of uh, operations that uh, you can do local squeezing and global beam splitters that leads to a state with sigma greater than one. And then it must be separable. The details are irrelevant here. I mean, they're, again, they're all spelled, set out in, um, in, spelled out quite, fleshed out quite in detail in the, in the notes, but I don't want to get into that. So that's an important lemma that we have. And now we're ready to go for the jugular, <laughs> which is find the, establish that this condition, the, the, the PPT is necessary and sufficient for such, for, for Gaussian states. Um, and uh, we do it this way. Well, we need some few more lines of preparation. So the first one is that there's a quantity, so, okay, so what is PPT? PPT is an expression about the positivity of the state, right? But if you remember, we had another, other ways of expressing, well, we had a Gaussian or phase space way of expressing this positivity, yeah, which was, uh, sigma plus i omega greater or equal than zero, the Eisenberg principle. Yeah? The one ingredient that we need is this and its consequences. Yeah? And among which are the fact that all the symplectic eigenvalues, these are the same. All the symplectic eigenvalues must be greater than one. Not the orthogonal eigenvalues, eh? Those can be smaller than one, and hence violate these and have some entanglement. But the symplectic eigenvalues must always be greater than one. They're one for pure states, like the vacuum. And, um, but this can be expressed also in another way, which we're gonna do now. Um, how do we see this, that this is the, best way to, uh, right, yes, so it must be able to express this in terms of all the quantities that are invariant under symplectic operations because, you know, you can apply a symplectic there, a symplectic there, and, and this will disappear. So this quantity must only depend on, on symplectically invariant quantities, and they're for an n-mode Gaussian states, there are n independent symplectical invariants, which correspond to the n symplectic eigenvalues, okay? Specifically, for a two-mode state, there is one, it's very simple, it's just the determinant of sigma. I'm mentioning this because there are several problems where it's convenient to to apply this, to, to use these invariants and to utilize them. So one is two mode, eh? Only for two modes. One is the determinant, which is always an invariant. 
because symplectic, uh, because symplectic operations by definition, because they have to satisfy this, right? So by Binet theorem, so they must be invertible because they're a matrix group, so they cannot have determinant zero, and by Binet theorem, uh, obviously, they must have determinant either one or minus one, and it turns out they always have determinant plus one, by the way. But, so they cannot change the determinant of sigma acting by congruence, so this must be an invariant. And the other invariant is a bit more exotic, but it's just, you can determine all the invariants by taking the characteristic equation that lets you find the symplectic eigenvalues, I couldn't go into that, and, and constructing the characteristic polynomial. This will be all the invariants, the coefficients of the polynomials. But, um, but one of them is very simple to write down, and it's this one. Okay, it's this quantity. It's so kind of interesting to see how that, tur that turns out to be an invariant. Let me see how much time. Yeah, let me do that because I don't want to. Uh, so the reason why this is a, a symplectic invariant can be seen by looking at the standard form. So any state can be brought into standard form. So this must be through local operation, eh? So this must be invariance because local symplectic operation are still symplectic operations. So, and then, so the invariance must be, the global invariance must be uh, expressible in terms of these four quantities. And so if you look at delta, that would be, uh, you know, a squared plus b squared plus two c plus c minus which turns out to be, if you regroup this as, if you take these two blocks, so reorganize this, this, these vectors as these squares, so shift the space and call this the x block, and the circles are the p block, that would just be trace the Hilbert-Schmidt product between sigma x and sigma p. And yeah, and then you can show that you can bring any matrix from the standard form to, uh, from this standard form to the normal form by operations that do not change this. And this proves that delta is an invariant. And it must be determined by the, by the, the, the eigenvalues. And the reason is that the beam splitter that we, saw, that we wrote before will just be rotations among this. And if you mix this beam splitter and local squeezers, you can do, you can bring this state into, into standard form, into normal form, into a state which is nu1, nu1, nu2, nu2. Uh, but I don't want to. I think, I think it's a good place. So let me just uh, clarify what we established, a few things. So we have that PPT, the violation of PPT, of positivity of the partial transpose, is a sufficient condition for entanglement in general. So for Gaussian states too. And then we have a couple of lemmas, one that says, well, the most important one is to say is that in a two-mode Gaussian state, if the determinant of sigma AB is greater or equal than zero, then rho is separable. And then we have a way to express positivity, which is this, oh, which then can be re-expressed in terms of the symplectic invariance as uh, as this, is this equation that sigma minus delta plus one greater or equal than zero. And then we have this final statement, that the deter because of the Eisenberg principle, I can't really, well, it's not difficult to show this, but you just need to express this delta 
the fact that that sigma is the product of the symplectic eigenvalues squared, and this is just the sum. And then this must be greater or equal than 1. If you, if you put everything together, you find this relationship. Yeah, so we have that this must always be true. We identify two invariants, and this must always be true for any covariance matrix to be physical. And then I'll come back and tell you how to describe partial transposition in phase space. And we put everything together and find a criteria and show that this is necessary and sufficient for two more Gaussian states, which solve that problem. And that's it. I think that's it for this lecture. We still we have one lecture in the afternoon, right? Yeah. Cool. Thanks.